our session this afternoon is uh, uh, we are bringing in all the aspects. At, at the limits, as you can see, we have no limits to uh, what areas we want to cover. And uh, our first speaker, Professor Michael Polkey, is a chess physician and uh, an expert on sleep studies. Uh, and uh, I've been told that uh, uh, I tell my fellows, if you want something published, talk about chocolate, uh, sleep, sex, uh, but do it well. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's certainly a fair introduction to bedroom life in the sleep lab. You know, we video everything, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all there. Um, listen, I hope this talk is, is what you want. Um, if it's not, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> but what I've done is I've just uh, got a very brief overview of obstructive sleep apnea, and then rather than try and cover the whole thing in three specialties all at once, I've just picked out a few highlights for the last couple of years in the hope that they'll be of interest. So, as I say, I'm just going to talk about what is sleep apnea, how you identify it, and how you define it. And I think there's a particular point there in reference to central sleep apnea, given that we have a lot of cardiologists in the room. And then briefly, I had a quick look around to see what's new. I mean, you know, if anything's ever new in medicine. And then we'll talk about uh, conclusions and directions. So ob obstructive sleep apnea, I think you all know, is, is, is the... Uh, technical term for your airway collapsing at night. Um, it tends to be related to your neck size, and that in turn is related to your body size. So just as a very rough rule of thumb, a BMI more than 28 kg per meter squared, a collar size more than 16 and one half inches, you're in potential risk territory. When I made this slide, oop, it affected around 4% of middle-aged men. But uh, oddly enough, uh, as the years have gone by, the, our public have become fatter, as indeed have I. <laughs> so the prevalence is higher. And in the worst cases, it's associated with significant hypoxia and sleep fragmentation. And it's thought that that can damage the various organs that are the target of this symposium. Um, these are the data. This was the original data, and this is the most recent revised data. And if I just draw your attention to this field, amongst your patients who are typically going to be aged 50 to 70, um, then the prevalence of sleep apnea in men, and this is proper sleep apnea with an AHI more than 15 events per hour and a net worth score, a net worth sleepiness score more than 10, is around 7%. So a lot of your patients will have this and it will be an increasing number. Um, how do you identify it? Well, you may get a, you may get a hint when you meet, when you meet the patient. Um, in particular in relation to body size, but the other things to ask about are snoring, and what we really want to know is can the snoring be heard in an adjacent room, um, and uh, does the patient stop breathing at night? Now that history is, oddly enough, fat snoring people, don't, they don't always have a bed partner, so that history is uh, sometimes absent, but uh, it's worth inquiring. Uh, diagnosis now is very easy. That one time you had to go in a sleep lab for a month and God knows what, but now we just do a home study and you see here the flow sensor at the, uh, at the nose is showing absence of airflow, so that's Greek for not breathing. The oxygen level falls and we know it's obstructive because from the rib cage and abdominal bands the patient is still trying to breathe. So this is a very classical uh, obstructive sleep apnea pattern, and this test we would normally do in the patient's own home. But, of course, I'm amongst cardiologists. So you guys will be interested in central sleep apnea. So you can see here a very classic example. Once again, there's no airflow, uh, but also on this occasion, there's no movement of the rib cage and abdomen. Um, and this is tremendously important when you come to um, do studies, and I'm, I'm in the presence of people who know more about this than me, but how do you define central sleep apnea? And we looked at this. This is a paper that we did back in the day in, in our lab, and you can see again, there's no airflow here, so I think we can all agree there's an apnea, yeah? Uh, in addition, though, there's no movement of the chest and abdomen, so you would say, wouldn't you, that this is a central apnea, but if you measured the pressure in the chest, and we also measured the EMG of the diaphragm, um, you can see that the patient actually is trying to make respiratory efforts. They're just not captured on the rib cage and abdominal signals. And about 50% of apparently central sleep apneas actually are obstructive in nature if you do the proper tests. 
So that's the first thing to say when you sort of get your report from your pulmonary colleague that this is central sleep apnea. It may not be. The other thing which a lot of people don't realize is that the classification traditionally has depended on half, on, on, a, on a rule of 50%. So if you have more than 50% central sleep apnea, let's say it's 55%, you get diagnosed as central sleep apnea, whereas actually if it's 45% and the 55 is obstructive, it's called obstructive sleep apnea. And I think everyone in this room will appreciate that life is not as simple as that. So this distinction between central and obstructive a slight pinch of salt, because they may not be central, and it depends on how you're dividing the night up. So, what's new in cardiology? Well, what's new in cardiology? <laughs> God knows. But I thought of, <laughs> I thought of, I thought of two questions. Um, number one, do we need to treat obstructive sleep apnea to protect the heart? And I'm thinking both in terms of uh, arteries, but also in terms of rhythm. And then what about central sleep apnea in heart failure? What do we think about that? So um, this was the, these were the happy times for sleep physicians because um, you could go around the world saying, look, sleep apnea is going to kill you. Please buy six CPAP machines immediately. Come and see me on a monthly basis and so on and so on. And the basis for that was a non-randomized trial that came from the Spanish registry. And you can see that if you look at hard cardiovascular endpoints, whether they're fatal or non-fatal, over 12 years of follow-up, the people with severe sleep apnea and no CPAP machine do much worse than those who don't. But don't forget, these are registry data. They're not randomized. But nevertheless, it didn't stop us talking about them as academics do. So the clever people said, well, why don't we do a randomized controlled trial? And this was the first randomized controlled trial, Mosaic, multi-center, UK, about 400 participants. And patients were randomized to have CPAP or best supportive care. Now, one of the funny things about wearing a CPAP mask at night, I take it everyone's seen one of these, is um, you know, they don't do anything for your image. And patients, patients don't really like wearing them. So the adherence in this study was 2.6 hours. And they had a composite vascular endpoint. And um, you can see here the stats. They were a bit unlucky, but they struggled to, to get anything positive of here. But they, they were close. They felt very close. But, they, but no cigar. Um, interestingly, one of the things they did find, and you see this consistently in any randomized controlled trial of CPAP, is that you, even amongst people who are not sleepy, you always see a benefit in the Etworth score. So CPAP really works for sleepiness. And they did a longer-term follow-up in the subsets who'd been randomized in Oxford. And again, they felt, oh, they're so close, they almost got there, 0.049. Um, and so, again, these were happy times for sleep physicians. We could go around to conferences like this and say, you must come and see me immediately. Um, and on the basis of that, it was estimated that you would need a trial of around um, 3,000 patients to detect a real benefit in cardiovascular endpoints. Now, what about heart rhythms? So, again, this is non-randomized data, but you can see that in terms of whether your pacemaker chooses to give you a shock or not, it's much more likely to do so if you also have sleep apnea and one of the other things that was identified is that if you've got sleep apnea, you get more shocks at night, um, which is presumably when the sleep apnea is taking place. So based on this, um, heart rhythm was an, you know, another big area for us, we, we hoped. Uh, and it may still be. Um, now, this is a graph, again, non-randomized, but showing the likelihood of your atrial fibrillation recurring after you've had it ablated. And once again, you can see the people with sleep disorder breathing are much more likely to, uh, to fail their ablation. And it's quite a common source. I'm just lucky we've got a lot of cardiologists in our hospital, but it's quite a common source of referral to me is, look, we've done this ablation twice, and the guy's still in atrial fibrillation. Would you like to have a think about him? Um, having said that, I showed you the data earlier from Mosaic, which was a randomized controlled trial of CPAP. And um, I'm hoping somebody in this room knows what any of these things mean. But because. Uh, <laughs> The only one I understand is the QT uh, interval, which uh, gets longer if you're on azithromycin. But the, the cardiologists who authors this, <laughs> the cardiologists who were the authors of this paper concluded that uh, electrophysiologic markers of uh, cardiac irritability, if you will, uh, were not changed by CPAP in the Mosaic trial. So they, they took the view that CPAP was unlikely to prevent, prevent uh, dysrhythmia or sudden cardiac death. But the data on that are... Um, are open, and we don't know the answer to that, but the point is not, I'm afraid, hopeful.
Now, what about, um, what about heart failure? Um, one of the interesting things about this field is that the, the studies have become bigger. So if you look at this kaplan meier curve, you can see the numbers are not enormous um, compared to later studies. But um, it shows an interesting thing about clinical trials. This is a patient with central sleep apnea, and the patients were randomized to either have CPAP um, or best usual care. And of course, the interesting thing is, it depends a little bit where you decide to do the analysis. If you'd done the analysis here, then you'd have been absolutely quids in, wouldn't you, and likely to have a highly statistically significant response. But they did the analysis here, and so it was a negative study. So for this reason, CPAP was not recommended for the treatment of central sleep apnea after Doug Bradley's paper. Now, it, be it became known by people who make ventilators that it was possible to have a halfway house between CPAP, which is a fixed level of CPAP that just holds the airway open the whole night, and a ventilator which blows when you breathe in and doesn't blow when you breathe out. And you could actually, if you were clever, arrange the ventilator to give you CPAP when you were breathing and then switch into a ventilator uh, when you were not breathing. And that allowed you to deal both with central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea in a physiological sense. And that was called adaptive sovo ventilation. And it seemed like a terrific idea because you could build these machines, sell them for you know, a commercially confidential sum, and uh, which was much higher than a CPAP machine. And so, um, oh, sorry, I should have said, by the way, um, one, of the one of the other rationales was that in patients in whom the, the uh, CPAP had suppressed the events, they seemed to do better. So based on that, uh, and uh, Martin, I'm a bit embarrassed presenting this in front of you, but you'll correct me if I uh, make any mistakes, but Martin Cowett and friends um, undertook this trial of adaptive servo ventilation in central sleep apnea, which probably is familiar to you all. Um, but it had this, as I say, novel PAP-based approach. Big study for the world of ventilation anyway. Um, and proper apnea and since the AHI was 15. One of the interesting things about this field, which I'll show you in my talks, is that people often recruit people with bare, barely sleep disorder breathing. Um, now, they had to have a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%. That sounds serious to me. Um, and these are the results. And what, we've, what was found was that the treatment group actually did slightly worse than the control group on either the primary endpoint, death from any cause, or almost anything else as far as I can see. And in a post hoc analysis, it seemed that that difference was due to sudden cardiac death. So we can discuss why that might be, and Martin will have his own ideas. I, one of the things we have seen, though, in studies of ventilation before is that when people get on a ventilator, they feel, yeah, I'm happy, I like this. Um, and I just wonder whether it may have delayed them seeking medical attention for other symptoms, but uh, Martin will be able to speak to that afterwards, I dare say. Okay, so enough of the heart. The heart always gets preference, doesn't it? I did think about rearranging it and doing nephrology, diabetes, cardiology in that order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting support from the podium here. Now, what about diabetes? It seems to me there are two uh, important questions here. Number one, can treating OSA prevent diabetes? That seems a very, very pertinent question. And number two, can treating OSA improve diabetes control? Um, and this second question is quite an interesting question because I deliberately, deliberately didn't cover high blood pressure, but for those of you who know the story, if, you're, if you've got obstructive sleep apnea and you are sleepy, then treatment of the obstructive sleep apnea with CPAP, as well as improving the sleepiness, will improve the blood pressure. But of course, it's a lot easier to improve the blood pressure by taking you know, a pill of your choice. And so this is quite important when you come to decide whether CPAP is actually the best option for what you're trying to do. So I think it's a given, and no, it won't come as any surprise to anybody to know that if you've got a lot of uh, large people, they will have both sleep apnea and diabetes. And these are the data that showed it. It just shows what, uh, what people are interested in. But here is the RDI bracketed into groups less than 5, 5 to 15, and greater than 15, which don't forget is the traditional CPAP treatment threshold. And guess what? If you've got... Um, a high RDI, you're much more likely to have insulin resistance either at, at three or 12 months after enrollment into this particular study, which contained about 6,000 participants. Um, so we know that. Now, um, about the time I gave this talk last, which is about then, um, there was really very little data, and I've summarized it. I borrowed this bloke's review 
and summarized it here, but you can look at the numbers here, 34, 42, 61. So suddenly from the world of cardiology, where we're dealing with thousands of patients, we've gone from dealing with you know, 40 or 50. Um, and these studies, on the whole, were negative. So what's happened since then? Well, in this study, again, it's a small study, um, but interesting, they had two-to-one randomization to CPAP, or with the permission of the ethical committee, they were, the, the other group received an oral placebo that they were told was extremely good. They had impaired, oh, help. They had impaired fasting glucose by American Diabetic Association criteria, either on the fasting uh, level or on the GTT. Um, and interestingly, the protocol said you had to have an AHI more than five to get in. This is a very low threshold. But reassuringly, the average AHI was 35, which is much more respectable. And then what was weird about this study, they must have had incredible funding, is that they, they kept them in the sleep lab for two weeks delivering personalized CPAP. So this is not a clinically feasible treatment approach. But what they found was that the AHI and the ODI uh, and index of sleep disturbance were all substantially improved by CPAP, which is what you would expect if you were you know, put in a sleep lab for two weeks and told you couldn't get out until you'd done this. <laughs> Very interestingly, because there is a story that some people in the audience will know about sleep opportunity and insulin resistance. There was no difference in total sleep time. But what was interesting was that um, after two weeks of intensive treatment, the CPAP group did uh, reduce the area under the curve on, on a glucose tolerance test. So physiologically, there was a, a suggestion that controlling the sleep apnea could improve glucose tolerance even in a two-week time frame, which is quite interesting. Now, sleep apnea patients tend to be fat. Um, so in this trial, again, these are not diabetic people. Di diabetes was an exclusion. Um, they took fat people who were not diabetic and they randomized them to have CPAP or not and measured the glucose tolerance. So it's not quite the same thing, but it's kind of similar. Obviously, they did it at home. So to get in, you had to have a BMI more than 40 or 35 with comorbidities. You had to have proper sleep apnea and it was a larger study. And in fact, this study was done amongst people who were waiting for uh, bariatric surgery. That's how they managed to get them to wait so long. Um, and they either had best supportive care or titrated CPAP. Uh, the study team managed to get them to use the device, which is very impressive, um, and had a very high adherence rate. We have this mythical number of four hours in the sleep world that if you can use your CPAP machine for four hours, then you're compliant. Um, and these are the results. Once again, again, these are not sleepy people, but even not being sleepy, the Epworth score falls from eight to five. It's a very consistent effect that, that you get a, always get an improvement in Epworth score compared to the control. Um, and on a fasting, uh, sorry, on a glucose tolerance test, the, the two hour peak glucose was reduced in the CPAP group. So again, amongst these pre-diabetic patients, uh, a suggestion that you're getting a, a improvement in glucose control with the use of CPAP. Now, what about if you've actually got diabetes? Again, a smallish study, I regret to say, but that's the nature of it. Um, once again, a low AHI inclusion criteria, but the average of participants was actually 32. One-to-one -one randomization, and they went on, in this case, for six months, um, and they had to have poorly controlled, or relatively poorly controlled diabetes with an HbA1c above 6.5%. Once again, they managed to get the people to use the device, and again, um, quite a high proportion exceeded this uh, threshold. And what they found, and I think this is interesting, because the prior study, the study that came from Oxford and Newcastle, um, was unable to show a benefit, and actually they didn't show a benefit at three months, but by the time they got to six months, this is the people with established diabetes, they were able to show an improvement in HbA1c if it had been elevated at the start, about seven and a half to start with. Um, and likewise for the HOMA test. So, in comparison to the previous UK study, um, these guys got them to use it for longer. Don't forget, five and a half hours compared with three and a half. And they went on for longer, three months versus six months. So I think my own personal view is that there is mileage in the diabetes story. And I think, of course, we need more data and so on. But physiologically, I've shown you that it can improve glucose tolerance. And it may just be a question of waiting for long enough to see the clinical benefits. Now, what about nephrology? This is going to disappoint you, John, I regret to say. Um, 
I could only think of one question, can treating sleep apnea reduce renal impairment? And I went back to this slide. Um, these guys run a kidney clinic somewhere, and they divided their patients into three stages of renal disease, totally normal in between and end stage renal disease. And what you can see very clearly is that the prevalence of sleep apnea rises uh, the more severe your kidney disease gets. Um, but despite having a careful look around PubMed, and I'm going to be embarrassed if anyone does know the answer, I'm afraid I'm unable to answer this question of whether CPAP uh, helps despite having a look, because I don't think the studies have been done. So for the, for the nephrologists in the audience, I would say, look, we don't know. Um, think about the diabetes, but if your patient is sleepy, it is possible that we can uh, help the patient, or at least your own sleep colleagues can. The other thing just to mention about dialysis and, and fluid is that it, you know, it moves up and down, and we do believe that fluid in the neck area can make obstruction worse. Okay, um, so having not got anything for the nephrologist, I wanted to finish, I wanted to find something for the nephrologist, so I was very interested in this, this study. This is a post-hoc analysis of a renal denovation study, which I'm sure everyone in the audience knows much better than me and was negative, but very briefly, 500 patients, two-to-one randomization, renal denovation for resistant blood pressure, taken overall, no benefit. But they did a post-hoc analysis, and the, they split the patients into those who were self-reported users of some kind of PAP device, CPAP or BiPAP, or not. Now, they didn't measure the compliance. We don't know anything about how, whether they should have been using it, and conversely, the people who weren't using it, we don't know whether they should have had a CPAP machine, but that's what they did. And this came out very recently. And what you find, these are the people who have got a machine, and these are the people who haven't got a machine, and these are different indices of blood pressure. Um, but what you can see is, amongst the people who don't have a CPAP machine, the study is indeed negative, but amongst the ones who did have a CPAP machine, it does seem that this renal denervation seemed to have uh, a benefit, particularly at night time. And the authors of this study uh, argued that what's actually happening is that if you've got sleep apnea, you've got a lot of sympathetic drive going down, um, if that has been removed by using a CPAP machine, then it gives you space for your renal denervation to work. Now, it's up to you whether you believe that, but that's what they say, and I believe there are some further studies ongoing to test that hypothesis prospectively. So I am slightly overshot my time, but just take-home messages. Sleep apnea is very common in patients with cardiac, diabetes, and nephrology problems, and that's because obesity is very common in all those diseases. CPAP is a highly effective therapy for sleepiness, your patients are at high risk of sleepiness, so do think about it and refer as necessary. Uh, use the Epworth score. Values greater than 10 are abnormal. Snoring, witnessed apnea, neck size, body size. CPAP reduces blood pressure in sleepy patients with sleep apnea. I didn't show you that. It's old data. CPAP doesn't seem to reduce cardiovascular events. It doesn't seem to improve markers of arrhythmogenesis. Uh, ASV is actually contraindicated in patients with central sleep apnea and reduced uh, cardiac function. CPAP probably can improve glycemic control. More studies are needed, but I'm very interested in it. And we certainly need some data in kidney dysfunction because I wasn't able to show you any. So on that note, I'm very happy to take questions, and I'm ap apologies for overshooting. Thank you.